Welcome to INST 314, Statistics for Information Science, with your host, Sean Jansen. We're continuing our topic on Z and T1 sample hypothesis testing, and now we're going to take and put this into R. I've shown you a little bit here and there sneaking R in to help us get our p-values, but we're going to go ahead and use R to help us determine our statistical hypothesis testing here. So we're going to see how this works for the means, and we're going to see how this works for the proportions in R. So let's go ahead and get started. So now, when we want to go ahead and run these tests in R, Keep in mind, the R script that we can use can use all the different examples we're working on, and we can recreate most of the formulas as sort of a by-hand approach inside R. But there's extra functions we can use to help us find critical values and p-values. Now, when you want to run a t-test in R, the function for it is t.test, with some data vector, the variable of interest, comma, and then mu that you have. We have additional options to help us figure out if we want to do a uh, one-tail upper or lower, or if it's two-sided, and if we want to specify a confidence interval. The default settings are to do a two-tail test and to give you a confidence interval of 95%, but you can go into the options to specify these out. What I really want to draw your attention to is where I wrote in vector. Now, vector means it has to be a column of data. It cannot be a single data value. So as we see, if we wanted to do the example with the education, and I gave you an exact point estimate, you wouldn't be able to use the t-test function here for that. But we would be able to recreate it by hand. So let's go ahead and see what we have here. And if I had, in this particular case, if I had GPA, so this was a survey where we had a bunch of students, and I had a vector of data, which I will provide you the script for. If you want to go ahead and run this yourself, it's going to generate random values that's going to match the sample statistics, and it's going to give you a sample mean of 3.0, a standard deviation of 0.7, and of 17. And we're going to go ahead and use the t-test in this case. So in the data I will give you in the script file, we've saved the sample GPA as an object called GPA. And then I specify comma mu equals 2.7 to say that this is the population average. And then I'm including here alternative two dots cited in quotes and conf equals to 0.95. Now, like I said, these are the default values, but I'm putting this here so you can go ahead and see it. And it's going to generate for me an output where I see that I get a t-score of 4.2, degrees of freedom of 116, and an extremely small p-value. Now, these scores differ a little bit from what we had by hand, but that in part is because the example I did on the previous slides was just using a point estimate of 3 and... Uh, didn't take into account some of these other values here, so it's going to differ a little bit. But it's still definitely going to go ahead and show these extreme differences that we had here, and still shows that we can go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. If I want to go ahead and find the probabilities and critical values, I said before we can use the function pt with the t score, comma, the degrees of freedom, to find out the probability, and we're going to do a 2 times pt to get a 2 tail test p-value. Now, just a little bit of a pro tip, instead of doing that two times, what we can also do is just do pt, in parentheses, put absolute value of t, comma, degrees of freedom, and we're always going to go ahead and get positive, uh, t, positive probability results. And if we want to get the critical value, we can flip it and instead do qt. And in qt, instead of putting the t score, we put in the probability of that t score we're looking for, comma, the degrees of freedom, and it will generate for us the critical value. So if we were to go ahead and plug this in here, what we could do is when we have a t-score of 1.71 with a 25 sample size, and we're doing a lower one-tail test, I could go ahead and do pt, absolute value of 1.71, comma 24, and it's going to give me the probability of 0.05. If I wanted to go ahead and find out what the critical value could be, if I have an alpha of 0.05 with sample size of 25, I can go ahead and find the lower tail test is going to be QT 0 0.025, comma 24. Remember that 24 is the degrees of freedom. And a high value of QT 0 0.975, comma 24. And both of those are going to tell me negative 2.06 and positive 2.06. These are the critical values that may seem familiar from when we were talking about these before when we were looking them up on the table there. Note it happens to be symmetrical. When we're doing the z-test by proportions, well, we're going to have to do our check by hand. So in this case, I'm just doing, I went ahead and I have the p sub s saved as ps, and that's 0.564. I've saved p sub u just as pu is 0.5, and I've saved n as 250. Oftentimes, if you want a little pro tip, go ahead and save the 
values from your analysis as objects, like P, S, P, U, and N, and you can go ahead and reuse them in your formulas, and it makes life very much easier, and accurate in case you make a data entry error. So in this case, we want to find the successes. I'm just doing a round, N times P sub U, comma, zero, so I can round to the whole number, and then, and then I'm going to say greater than 10. If it says true, then I'm good. If Then I'm going to do round n times 1 minus p sub u, comma, 0, greater than 10 for failure. And it's going to go ahead and say that we're true, we're also good there. And when I want to go ahead and get a z-score, I can just do a by hand approach, where then I take each of these values and I do ps minus p u in parentheses for my numerator, divided by, and in my numerator, open parentheses, square root of p u times 1 minus p u divided by n. And so when I go ahead and do this, if I want to go ahead and get my critical values and p-values, my z-critical, I can use the q-norm on the probability, and that's going to tell me the probability at any given level of alpha. If I'm doing a two-tailed test, remember you have to split your alpha in half, so it's going to be half that probability. And so if I want to do a p-norm on a z-score, I can go ahead and put in p-norm, absolute value of the z-score, and that's going to give me the probability for a one-tailed test, absolute value, because then it doesn't matter if my z-score is positive or negative, rather. And keep in mind here, I misspoke, p-norm negative absolute value. That way it gives you the, the p-value that's very small. Otherwise, it's going to give you the upper tail, which you're going to be in like in the 90 probability. So again, just to make sure you heard me correctly, 2 times p-norm of a negative absolute value z-score, that's going to give you the p-value of a 2 tail of a z-score that you have. To get the z-critical, you can use q-norm. P norm for probability, Q norm for the critical. And all you have to do is plug in the alpha level you want. In this case, alpha of a two tail, Q norm of a 0 0.025 gives us a negative 1.96, and Q norm of 0 0.975 gives us a positive 1.96. So if before we had an example where we had the different, the Z score from our Maryland voting, so I'm going to do a two times P norm of negative absolute value 2.02, .02, and that tells us 0.43, and that's the probability from that. Now when we're doing t the proportions, we can go ahead and use the function binom.test and prop.test, but there's a little difference to figure out which one we're going to use and when. The binom.test can help us do the proportions test to give us an exact binomial. Use this when you have a small sample size. Prop.test, use this when we have sample size greater than 30, because it helps us to get approximations closer to a binomial. There are minor differences under the hood that's going on in R between the two of these, so just keep in mind sample size to help you figure out which one's which if you want to be the most accurate with your results. So if we want to go ahead and plug in some of these things, if we use the, the scripts are nearly the same for them. Binom.test and prop.test both use X, which is the number of successes. N, that's the total number of trials or observations that you have. P is the probability to test against. And they both have alternatives if you're doing two tails or one tails. And then the prop.test also allows for a correct equals true, which would be a case if you have a Yates continuity correction, which in most cases we're not going to worry about this because the default setting is true, because if you only have a yes or no sort of situation, option A, option B, then you have a, a Yates continuity correction test for the prop.test situation. But don't worry about that, it's usually set to default true, and that's where part of it's going to help get you those larger results. Now. What you see up there on the screen are the default settings for binom test and prop.test. So if we wanted to go ahead and set up some of these for the prop.test where we did the example before with the Maryland voters, I'm using the 141 individuals where the sample that said they were going to vote, comma 250 is the n value, how many did we have? P in this case was null, I'm not specifying a null probability because I want it to equal out at 0.5. If you did want to match it against some different population parameter probability, put that in here, otherwise it defaults to 0.5. And then it goes ahead and tells us our p-value, I'm sorry, our probability was the 0.56 that we calculated, it gives us an interval for it, and we get a p-value of 0 0.499, which is close to the one that we calculated out by hand. And with that, that covers everything that we're going to cover on how to do these tests in R for both the means and the proportions. Like I said, some of these we do by hand, some of them we get functions for. And with that, I'll see you in the next video.